ESG is a topic that uh, I don't need to tell you has become more and more uh, front and center and companies uh, are looking you know, at how to build up these ESG frameworks within their companies. ESG covers such a wide range of topics. So we really wanted to help uh, companies you know, in identifying which are the key ESG metrics that we think you could focus on depending on which industry you're in, uh, of course, but you know, uh, which are really the key ESG metrics that are that are relevant, um, you know, how can you, as you look at multiple aspects of ESG and you're covering many different metrics, how do you consolidate that into a simple and intuitive assessment of your company's position when it comes to ESG? And then also provide you some recommendations for how to build that into compensation and how you can uh, uh, perhaps provide a bit more thorough ESG reporting um, when it comes to the rating agencies and to other organizations. So that was really what our key objectives were with developing this framework. We really tried to take a broad view of really, really the multiple providers that are out there. And we came up with you know, uh, over 1,200 metrics that we evaluated. This was a, a, a long process, uh, but really a very informative one in terms of going through these 1,200 metrics covering E, S, and G. Uh, and what we did is we really tried to categorize these metrics so that it's easier for the uh, participants uh, who get the ESG framework to navigate uh, the metrics. So you can navigate them not only by topic, um, you know, really the ESG topics, the type of metric, uh, but also, you know, to help re from a reporting perspective, uh, the GRI codes that they um that they uh, respond, that they correspond to. So really trying to create a framework that's very practical uh, and that uh, is easy to implement uh, within your organization. We did collect a lot of feedback, as I said, from the different participants that uh, participating companies that joined us. And we really summarized this into a final framework, uh, at least into a first draft. I think as we go on and as we gain learnings and uh, um, and as the industry develops, we will uh, be updating that uh, and also updating that uh, through our uh, communications and contacts with the, with the ESG panel. Some of the things that we've learned so far, uh, as I said, as we really digged into all of these different metrics, we saw that you know ESG is a topic. It's 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 not just about doing good. It's also and it's about doing well. So, you know, while it is about, you know, really long-term sustainability and building in that, that long-term sustainability of your company, uh, you know, a lot of the ESG metrics do not necessarily have come at the cost of, um, uh, of, of the financials, which I think is some of the perception that may be out there at the moment. Uh, what we see is that really the majority of the ESG metrics really are long-term profit oriented and really for the benefit of long-term profit uh, for shareholders. We do see that it's more about only the quantitative metrics at the moment, uh, and we'll touch on that later on in the webinar, companies are focusing on very few areas within the ESG landscape, uh, things like climate change, things like diversity, um, and really looking at some very hard numbers. And that is uh, certainly very valuable. We do see a potential to widen that out into uh, to really capture how a company is addressing ESG as a whole. So not only the actual hard numbers that they have achieved so far, you know, but what is that company? What are the company's priorities? What are the efforts and the achievements that they're making, not only from a quantitative point of view? We believe that companies have an opportunity to take a broader view, tell a broader ESG story, uh, but that does come with certain uh, challenges when it comes to summarizing and consolidating these metrics into a, a simple and intuitive or even a single value to, to communicate their ESG position. <clears throat> and that's something that we'll go into, uh, to, we'll touch on uh, briefly today and uh, go into, uh, that's certainly something that we cover very much so in the framework. Uh, I often heard from companies and also from uh, sustainability experts that they wish the different ratings from the different uh, ESG rating agencies would converge into a single value. And I think uh, this is something that is not going to happen because uh, these organizations have been built with different objectives. There are companies that have been built out of governance uh, issues. They started with the disclosure of compensation when ISS started doing business, uh, which was later called proxy advising. 
And then there are others that, that didn't start with a governance uh, issue in mind. They started with the environment in mind, you know, uh, the, the carbon disclosure project, CDP, the task force for um, uh, climate related financial disclosure, SBTI, the, the science based targets in initiative. So these are other companies doing ratings that are have a very, very different focus. Then, of course, you have the rating agencies like also by uh, Vigo Iris that, that is here today, and they cover a breadth of um, ESG criteria. But again, they have to make decisions what their priorities are. Finally, there are companies that are focused on the social aspects. Now, if you have so different interests in ratings, you will never have a convergence of ratings uh, for the company itself. So it's not possible to just say, let's just take an external rating from someone that does it and we are fine. You really have to do your own rating because it's not just the rating agency that influence yourself. You also have a lot of different constituents that do not even read the ratings from the rating agencies. They want to, uh, they want to understand you. They want to learn from you how well you do on ESG. It's the customers, it's the regulators, it's the, it's the suppliers, and, um, and of course, uh, the investors themselves. Most of the investors have said that they, they uh, actually assess the sustainability performance on their own. And for that reason, we believe a company will need to develop their own ESG rating. It's not really a rating because it's not comparable to others. But what they do have, what they have to do is they have to assess their ESG performance, be very transparent about what they do, and be transparent about their targets and how well they have achieved their targets. And this is exactly the objective of the ESG framework that we're introducing today. So when I mentioned this uh, in, in the beginning, you know, as part of this framework, uh, we did take a look at where companies are currently putting their focus when it comes to ESG uh, and, and really looking at measuring and reporting their performance and also building into, into compensation. And what we've started with is, as I said, we had this, you know, 1200 metrics that we looked at, we put them into different categories. So what you see here are, you know, split across uh, environmental, social and governance uh, uh, the topics, the ones that we saw emerging and the, they are shown here relative to the size uh, and uh, I wouldn't necessarily say the importance, but the frequency that we saw them appearing uh, within, uh, within our analysis. So things like emissions, uh, energy, em employee needs, diversity, <clears throat> and inclusion are some of the bigger topics in terms of the focus um, that we've seen. Uh, but that's not to say that they are <clears throat> that they are the most important. We do see quite a lot of other uh, topics that are that are covered. So you can see there's really a breadth, uh, you know, in our framework, we've come up with 33 different categories. Uh, and if we move on to the next slide, Herman, what we see is that, uh, again, this is just from our point of view, quite a lot of these um, are impacting your long-term profit and the long-term um, uh, business of the, uh, of the company and kind of that long-term um, profit for shareholders. So really there's very few that are, uh, let's say that don't have some kind of an impact on that long-term profit. And even though it's quite a, quite a lot of categories that you see here, uh, if we go on to the next side, we do see that a lot of companies are focusing on really just a few areas. As I said, I think a lot of companies are, there's, there is a lot of focus at the moment amongst uh, shareholders, organizations, uh, other stakeholders on things like uh, greenhouse gas emissions, on things like diversity and inclusion. And that's where we see a lot of the focus being placed. Um, you know, we looked at Siemens, ABB, Credit Suisse, Roche and Swisscom. And what you can see is that each individual company is really only looking at a very few um, uh, areas as part of their compensation. So Siemens, it could be, you know, it's carbon emissions, it's net promoter score. So, you know, very customer oriented. And then from an employee perspective, uh, training hours per employee, um, a, a company like uh, Swisscom is looking very much at uh, just one aspect, uh, looking at it from a customer's perspective. Um, so what you see is that it's really very focused when it comes to executive compensation. Now, if you look at these companies, 
the metrics that they're focusing on, you know, they may or may not even align that closely with the company's strategic objectives or prior, um, priorities. Uh, but these are the ones that they have called out. I think that what we see is that there's really an opportunity to go broader. If we look at, you know, the, the dots on the graph, you know, they are falling within just a, very, a number of the categories. And even there, uh, it's not ticking off the entire box. So employee needs is a very broad topic. It's covering training. It's covering, um, you know, uh, uh, employee um satisfaction, it's covering uh, benefits, uh, it's covering all different kinds of, you know, employee health, uh, very, a lot of different aspects. It's gotten two dots, uh, but really in, because it's looking at things like training, uh, uh, talent management, uh, et cetera. So even where you see the few dots on the graph, um, they're also not covering the entirety of that topic. Uh, so we do see that there is really a broad, there's an opportunity to tell a much broader ESG story, to talk about the ESG topics that are relevant for rating agencies, for organizations, uh, but that aren't necessarily the most topical at the moment. And these may also be the areas where, from, an, from a company perspective, you can really touch a, a wider audience of your executives and your employees. The number of employees who can really affect the carbon emissions is quite limited in many companies, um, but they can have an impact on something like a net promoter score or um, uh, some of the other, you know, so many of the other ESG uh, topics. So we really see an opportunity to not only in, be inclusive of much more executives and employees when selecting the ESG priorities that you report on and that you build into your compensation, we also see the opportunity to tell a much broader story to uh, to your shareholders and your stakeholders. I think we have someone uh, with us from a com corporate communications. Uh, we also have had some people in the panel from an investor relations perspective. So really being able to talk not only about the most topical ESG topics, but also uh, much more broadly in terms of what your company uh, is, is doing and achieving in some of the other uh, areas of ESG. Yeah, when it comes now to these areas, you know, and you we come actually to the problem that we want to discuss to, today and where we have a solution, uh, take Swisscom, they just look at a net promoter score uh, for customers. They, they don't look at their employees. They don't look at their energy, their emission, recycling uh, resources that they're using, uh, lots of areas that are profit relevant for Swisscom. Uh, and they're not doing that. And you would wonder why. Uh, and what we've heard, heard in the market quite often is, uh, well, it gets too complicated. We cannot use all these different metrics for compensation purposes. And here we actually found a solution where we think this is possible. Before I introduce the solution or before I discuss uh, the challenges that we have uh, encountered, just remember that profit isn't the single metric either. You know, when you're a sustainability expert and people tell you, you know, so far it was so easy, I just had to increase earnings per share. You can tell them, well, earnings are not just one number. There, actually, uh, a no there is actually a number where a lot of things flow into. It's your revenues, it's your prices, it's your marketing expenses, your employee expenses, it's your R&T. There's a lot of stuff that flows into, into profits. And if we then add uh, the ESG metrics that you see here on the, on the right side, uh, all these metrics that you want to add to get a bigger story, to get a fuller story of your enterprise performance that has an indication how profitable you will be in the long term, the thing that you actually need is a consolidation method. So you need a way to, to turn all these metrics into something that is comparable. And, uh, and we, are, we have worked on that, of, of trying to make the, the variety of metrics with very different characteristics, financial characteristics, comparable to each other. The problems that we encountered were manifold. I think that the biggest problem is really the, the time horizon. In ESG, you quite often have the situation that you want to achieve something, but you're far away from, from reaching it. So if you want to go carbon neutral in 2030, something that certainly Swisscom should aim for, um, you definitely are not there. Uh, and there are years to get there. Uh, and what do you do now when you assess your ESG performance, when you have not reached your long-term goal for a long time? Another, another problem is that we have, uh, we have uh, identified is, is the, the, the characteristics of a maximum. You know, if you look at profits, 
you can always increase your profits theoretically. I mean, there's always something that you can sell more and make a higher profit, but many of these G metrics have a ceiling. And sometimes there's a situation where uh, a certain number below the ceiling is already a good target, like 80% recycling uh, for Swisscom may already be quite, uh, quite a good achievement or for other companies as well. So how do you assess that performance? You cannot say they're at 80% of target because they're already good. What do you do about that? And then, you know, one of the problems is, you know, many of the targets you cannot be exceeded. What do you do about that? What do you do if your target is finite? finite? Or what do you do if your target is quite quite low. Maybe you cannot recycle 80% of your materials. Maybe you can only recycle 20% of your materials. And if you say you reach target at 20% of recycling at, at, at 40%, you're basically at double target, which is kind of strange, you know, to say like, oh, we, 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 we double our target and we are only at 40% recycling. So what do, you, what do we do with the upside above the target that, that may actually have a leverage that that uh, that then displays the ESG performance too well. Um, we have a problem with volatility on the left side. You see a typical situation where you want to scale an ESG target. So you have a target. You have to define what is your maximum of that target, what is your minimum, and then basically for the minimum you assign a value of of maybe zero percent of target. At, at, uh, uh, at the target, you have 100% of target. And if you're at the maximum, you have 200% of target. Well, that's fine. But what do you do if your ESG metric is so volatile that you're either at the minimum or at the maximum? So one, one year you say like, oh, we, we don't achieved the ESG target at all. And the next time you look at it, you, you basically say, oh, we are really on top of the target. And then also line of sight, you know, uh, I used the, the graph for reaching zero, uh, zero emissions uh, by 2030 before. But what if that is quite easy at the beginning? You know, you have lots of achievements at the beginning at, where you move up the ladder quite quickly. And then it gets more and more difficult over time. Or the other way around, you know, you will actually have to do a lot of investments to to get to uh, uh, to get to a, a point where um, your where your uh, performance actually approves and reaches closeness to the target. So for a long time, down here you're at the quite low level, and then only at the end you kind of move quickly to achieving the target. So the solution that we that we really found uh, that we now call the triple bottom line is is to scale the achievement on, on those metrics that you have on a common um, uh, scale <laughs> uh, to put them on a common scale. So you've seen it before when I discussed the problems. You know we used numbers like 100% of target, 200% of target, or 0% of target, and that's something you have to do. Basically, uh, you need a scale for each metric that, that has the same values that goes from ideally from 0% to 200% where 100% is the target. We advise against uh, the school grading system that is deployed by a lot of credit rating agencies today uh, of A plus, uh, A minus, you know, A, B, C, D. Uh, F is not existing. <laughs> Nobody fails uh, in that world. But uh, we believe that it's a lot, a lot less intuitive to use uh, an alpha, an alphabetic scale than a scale from 0% to 200% where 100% is target achievement. And the good thing about that is that if you put each of those ESG metrics onto that scale, and sometimes 80% is 100% achieved, sometimes 80% is 150% achieved. So you, you turn the actual metric into a, a percent achievement, allows you then to add up very, very different categories of performance, including financial performance, by the way. So you, you could actually uh, consolidate everything to a triple bottom line. Some have been a little bit concerned when we introduced that, uh, uh, the Logitech CEO, uh, 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 Brock and Darrell said, you know, uh, he doesn't want to have the financials there. Uh, and it's obviously why, because it, it makes you aware that financial is only part. Financials are only part of your performance. And Logitech's financials, of course, were all 
outperforming to a high degree. And now when you actually put them next to other things that are important, it looks a lot, a lot less meaningful. So in, the, in practice, actually, you will probably just look at the ESG metrics and make them comparable in this water flow chart. And I've shown you uh, on the next page how this is actually done. And this is a real example for a company. So we, had a, we have a company uh, where, that we served this, serviced this summer that puts the energy or puts the, the emphasis, oops, the emphasis on these five ESG aspects, carbon innovation, gender materials, water. They've outperformed on carbon, outperformed on water and they're just at target on innovation and they are below targeted materials so so you can immediately see that you know the different esg uh, aspects matter but they matter in an intuitive way and the resulting overall company performance then becomes very very intuitive because it's just the average of those metrics before if you turn that into a waterfall chart uh, it's basically the same thing now on the right side where you can see the contribution of each metric to the overall bar of the company. And this has the advantage that you can actually also use weightings. So if carbon is important for you and you want to weight it double than the others, you can do that here and you cannot do it here. You cannot just say it's 400%. Oops. Uh, but on the right side, you can, you can actually use weights depending on your priorities. And this is really what we recommend companies to do. Define your priorities. It's, it must be your priorities, not the priorities of another organization, but it must be your priorities. Define the metrics that flow into those priorities. Here in this case, gender, uh, there, was, there were two metrics. There was a metric for the overall population of the company, and there was a metric for the management team. And each metric had their own achievement curve basically turning a percentage into an achievement value. And the result is, 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 is what you see here in terms of gender is already a consolidated value. The beauty of this is you communicate very effectively towards rating organizations, towards investors, towards all other stakeholders, what is important to you and how well you perform. The beauty of this um, way of communicating your ESG performance is it translates directly into a compensation solution. The only thing that you have to do really uh, in order to understand how much you want to pay your employees is to turn your achievement values, which can go from 0% to 200% into target bonus multiples. So if you are at 100%, you basically get one times bonus. And in the case that we did for this company, 144% ESG achievement, which you communicate towards the outside world, turns into a 1.44 times uh, target bonus for your managers. And this is really the executive compensation uh, solution that we have developed with those uh, almost 10 participating companies, including uh, Novartis, Logitech, uh, Bucher Industries, Hilti, Sika uh, was also part of it, Dead Wheeler. So we had quite a few brains coming into this. And, and this is the solution that we have discussed and that we want to develop further now in an ESG panel where more companies can participate and share their problems and then find common solutions together. Uh, what we wanted to do is, you know, tying back to what, you know, Herman was showing in terms of the consolidation with the example of, um, uh, you know, the, the employee uh, and inclusion uh, number um, metric, which included two different ones. You know, there is, uh, when you look at a particular topic, quite a few different metrics that you can look at to include. So what we did is uh, when we developed this framework, like I said, we took, uh, we gathered all of the metrics that we found from really a large number of, uh, of providers, um, which was over 12, 1,200 of them. We did, uh, you know, our end result, um, our end goal was really to come up with a short list of metrics across the ESG uh, landscape, which we would recommend as being the ones to choose from. So it's a list of 170 metrics, which we think are most relevant. And then depending on your company's priorities and ESG priorities, you can select from that list. Uh, and there it really goes into a very 
granular list uh, across the 33 different categories that we that we found. 170 metrics is still a pretty long list. Uh, so what we also did is with all of these metrics, we we categorize them so that it's a little bit easier to navigate and search um, the, the framework. So we've looked at not only the the type of metric, um, and this is something that we talk, touched on a little bit, is you know many of them are quantitative metrics. So what was the percentage of women uh, you know, at the board level? What was the percentage of the employee base that is uh, you know, the, the gender diversity, et cetera? What is the level of carbon emissions? These are all very hard numerical values. Uh, but what we saw is that there are also quite a number of metrics that are not looking at these specific quantitative values, but also that uh, help to represent what we call effort. So, you know, there are a lot of metrics that look at, for example, you know, the existence or the depth of scope of a policy when it comes to a particular ESG topic. Um, you know, is there a strategy in place? Are there initiatives, programs uh, in place? And how much do they include? Uh, these are also some of the metrics that you can look at. Um, that's really at the kind of the beginning of the chain is defining your strategy and policy and the programs. Then you have your actual achievements, which are often these quantitative values. But then even after beyond that, there is then, let's say, from a reporting perspective, how transparent is your reporting? How frequent is your reporting? Uh, is it audited? Uh, are you belonging to certain organizations? And these are some of these non uh, numeric metrics that we have also included, which we think are very valuable in terms of representing a company's efforts in improving from an ESG perspective. So for companies that are maybe early on in the journey of building up an ESG framework, potentially defining the priorities, the programs, the activities to reach that ESG performance, we do see that there is a way for you to still capture that uh, from a reporting perspective and also from a compensation perspective. So it could be, you know, different ways that you want to include, you know, um, whether or not a, a policy has been defined, uh, whether a certain number of programs have been achieved, uh, and what that level of achievement might be, uh, independent of the resulting numeric value or performance in that particular area. So I think this is where we see a lot of potential for companies to tell a broader story, to include uh, topics that, um, you know, that are also much broader uh, also for your employee base. So really being able to have a wider pool of metrics to, se to select from, even if they might not be the um, kind of the, 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 the traditionally the easiest way of measuring, you know, I think as Herman said, there's quite a lot um, of different ways that you can um, consolidate these metrics. So we've structured them by that metric type. We have the different uh, ESG categories. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we've also assigned GRI codes to each of them so that uh, when it comes to reporting, you can make sure that you're reporting as much as you potentially could. Uh, there's sometimes data within the organization that's not getting communicated externally. So that's the framework. Uh, you know, we provide you the, with the metric list. We provide you with those consolidation um, guidance, uh, and then also that triple bottom line uh, illustration that Herman showed earlier. When we look at the panel, uh, we mentioned that we have started this panel initially with the, the companies that you see listed here. We found that it was a very, uh, a very helpful exercise for the different participants, also for us in developing this framework. Uh, and we wanted to continue the panel also into next year. So uh, as we define the uh, ESG panel, this is something that we encourage you to join. Uh, you would be able to get updates to the framework that we talked about. So the metric list, uh, you know, the consolidation guidance, et cetera. Uh, it also includes direct contact to Obermott. So being able to uh, sort of uh, reach out to us with specific inquiries and sort of a help desk. Uh, when it comes to any uh, in, any issues or challenges um, or just questions that you might be facing regarding you know how to measure these ESG metrics, how to implement them, how to consolidate them, uh, you know whether it be for reporting or for your compensation purposes, we are here for that um, for that uh, for, for that discussion. 
Um, it would also, I think one of the benefits of the panel is not only being able to reach out to Obermont, but also to other participants in the panel, uh, to your peers. Uh, you know, we have participants in the panels coming from sustainability, coming from finance, coming from HR, coming from uh, compensation. Uh, so really a, a, a breadth of expertise and the areas that we really see being most touched by um, this ESG uh, framework and uh, re reporting and compensation. So email contact to the different participants. We would also be providing networking events. Uh, at the moment, they've been virtual. Uh, we hope that one day we'll be able to meet people uh, face to face. Uh, and then also we have an annual event. So as we update uh, the, the framework, we also, uh, we do that in an annual event with all of the participants. Uh, you know, we would also be reaching out to see if there are any particular challenges or topics that you'd like to cover. And that's something that we would touch on within the annual event. Thank you, Candice, for doing that with me. And then I wish you a uh, uh, <laughs> good appetite. Thank you.